not trip on the stairs, but we can set the proper mood for this evening. I'd like to welcome you all, discerning, well-read folks, to the Joko Cruise 2022 edition of Horse First Chapter. The concept is simple. Write an intentionally terrible first chapter to a book that doesn't actually exist. Could be by yourself, could be in the style of another author, real or fictional. This is going to get weird. May I please introduce to you this evening's round of authors. Storm Vigasanza. Jonathan Colton. Rika Aoki. John Salzi. And Gail Simone. Each of these authors has written a new original work for this evening. But in the interest of easing into the proper tone, the air of dignity that this event truly requires, I wanted to ask one of our authors to bring out a classic, if you will, one of the original first. This event started uh, on this ship as Worst First Page. It was just a first page, supposed to a chapter, uh, and this was one of the most memorable and first voice of those pages. We welcome to the podium, Gail Simone. Halo, crimson below, and summer sky golden above. There were two of them, these mountains. <laughs> Twins in all respects. Tall enough and deep enough to make traversing a scant few leagues a matter of weeks, not hours, and the cost of one of potential life and death rather than a few calluses to put sore travelers. Entire winter trading parties had taken the path too thin and weren't found at the final resting place, the bottom of the chasm between the brothers, until the snow melted months later in that brief period between flood and drought. Dumbledore and Gandalf were going to the Pull my staff, Dumbledore, said Gandalf the White, who was totally into it. <laughs> Does staff mean penis? Harry understood as Dumbledore. Penis. 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 Harry <laughs> said Gandalf flirtatiously. Wang had a double door, hopefully. <laughs> I think it's time we met the two blue wizards, grinned Gandalf, knowing <laughs> his rope. Well, I think you should go nuts on my Patronuts, <laughs> said Dumbledore. Author's note, I then had to stop for a while for personal reasons. <laughs> Okay, back to the story. As the sun sank more deeply beyond the mountains, the two lovers lay glistening in a paddock, looking upwards at the stars, smoking quietly from their pipes. It was 
looks like a hobbit hole. <laughs> and that means comfort. So, uh, <laughs> you're filthy, the friend there, giggled Dumbledore. And suddenly, a cackling voice interrupted. Well, 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 do you mind if I join the party? It was the Wicked Witch from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and they all tumbled together in a flurry of pews. <laughs> gray, green, and gray. <laughs> and the mountains paid them no mind. <laughs> P.S. The mountains were butt. Thank you, Chris. He's going to be coming out in between each reading to wipe the literature off. <laughs> I would next like to welcome, I apologize, I called it a podium before. This is a lectern. Shame upon me. And shame upon you for not immediately calling me out. I'd like to call our next author to the lectern, Paul Sibor. Fuzzy the Bear's Big Day by Paul Sigourney. Fuzzy Rumpkins was the snuggliest teddy bear in Cumblefart Junction. He had cute, shiny black eyes that danced when he laughed, which meant that they danced all the time. He had a nose that was cute as a button, which was only partly due to the fact that it was an actual button. He had soft, fuzzly arms that hugged eagerly without hesitation, and for just long enough, which in Cuddlefart Junction was as long as you need. And he had that most important of teddy bear features, a fluffy tummy filled with blood. Aww. It's a soft place where frowns and sads go to die. He would always giggle just before wrapping another friend in a lovey hug a -boo, which was the mostest specialist hug from his deep repertoire of hug types. But beyond all these wonderful things, Fuzzy Rumpkins had a butt filled with farts. And in Cuddle Fart Junction, that was the most important thing for a teddy bear to have. Because each fourth year on July the Happy Team, every teddy bear in the land gathers around in the Junction Square for the big farting contest to determine the supreme bear. Today was July the Happy Team. And Fuzzy Rumpkins had just turned five, which meant he was finally old enough to compete. <laughs> Fuzzy imagined himself sitting on the Supreme Bear throne, eating all the candy he wished, anytime he wanted, with nobody to tell him that he couldn't. He'd be a good Supreme Bear, he thought. He'd share his candy with all his teddy bear friends, and he'd give them important jobs, like Jasmine Windy Poops who sat next to him in the bear school. She could run the Department of Lovely Thoughts. His kindly next-door neighbor, Tubby Underbump. He could be in charge of the strategic lollipop preserve. And all of Fuzzy's other school friends, too. Timmy Biscuit Hams, Boo Boo Jam Tarts, Aromatic Billy, and even Little Flower Bottom, who was only two. They could all live in the Supreme Bear Palace with them, and they would just play and play and play. Why, even Dutchman the Outsider, who wasn't a bear at all, but an old human man who lived in a hut way out past the fluff barns and the lactose fields. He always seemed grumpy, and he smelled like the Netherlands. But he gave Fluffy a quarter once for helping him bust up an old ship road. And sometimes, when deep in his cups, he would come to Fuzzy's door and talk for hours about the best hard candies from a place called Utrecht. <laughs> yes, even Dutchman the Outsider would be welcome. In fact, Fuzzy realized that he'd need a good king's contrivance, and perhaps Dutchman the Outsider was the perfect man for the job. But Fuzzy 
he knew that before the palace and the plane and the government appointments, first must come the farting. <laughs> he'd always gotten straight A's in farting class, and he'd been captain of the farting team at school for over a year. And while there were lots of great farters on the team, sweet beefs, Bam Bam Biscuit Hams, Pants Coughing Winslow, and even the fart goalie, Brown Casper. <laughs> they all knew that Fuzzy was the best of the bunch. As he walked slowly and determinedly towards the junction square for the start of the contest, Fuzzy Rumpkins knew three things. He knew he would have to believe in himself. He knew that it would take his greatest effort ever if he were to stand a chance against Turk Cutter Wumbles. <laughs> the winner of the past four contests and current Supreme Bear. And he knew that he had a secret advantage over everybody else, the handful of magic beans in the right front pocket of his overalls. Beans that he had gotten from the old tree wizard who lived deep in the darkest part of Gumdrop Forest where most bears dared not go. Beans that the old tree wizard had given to Fuzzy in exchange for his soul. <laughs> Please welcome our next author, Storm Dickens. So please forgive me, I've, I've taken some liberties with the format just a little bit, uh, but considering the liberties that have already been taken, I expect to be forgiven. <laughs> the Frankly Delicious Food Blog. First post. Hello, delicious world. Welcome to Frankly Delicious, your new block away from home where you'll find culinary adventures that are, frankly, delicious. I know, I know. You're saying to yourself, oh, great. Here's yet another long-winded so-and-so sharing recipes for things you've already made a thousand times. Well, damn it! I hate that, too. So come on, let go of your inhibitions because it's time to put your tippy toe and the whole rest of your body onto a path that will have you making food that's frankly delicious. <laughs> do you smell that? I sure do. <laughs> we all do. Because smell is the only sense that carries memories. And who doesn't remember family gatherings featuring fun, family, and mom's famous meat love? It's already pretty great, isn't it? <laughs> and mm, mm, I see you shiver with anticipation. <laughs> I recently had occasion to make this recipe when unexpected company dropped in. You know how it is. You plan for a certain number, and suddenly you have extra lips to feed. I suppose I could have turned them away, but what fun would that have been? It's actually a rather peculiar story. And damn it! I got myself sidetracked. So let's get it back to the beginning. The ingredients. In my case, I didn't have any extra on hand, and it was far too late and rainy to go to the supermarket. But when you have leftovers in the freezer and at least half a brain, you'll figure something out. In my case, inspiration literally sprang right out of the deep freeze and demanded my attention in the form of a large singing man riding a motorcycle. I struck a corner. My gate was horrified, but I assured Rocky that it was the mercy killing. But damn it! I got sidetracked again. So let's cut to the chase. The recipe for famous meat loaf. Step one, roasts the chunkiest portions of one fully thawed and newly deceased biker singer popularly known as meatloaf until tender. <laughs> Step two, place unused portions of meatloaf in a casket nested in the center of a large banquet table. Step three, cover it all with a tablecloth and 
and serve the roasted bits to your guests. And finally, step four, after everyone has consumed the portion, unveil the source of the feast. Now, if your guests are anything like mine, they'll scream for more. And if anyone complains that it's meatloaf again, don't be discouraged. They're definitely the ones that more than anyone else found this recipe to be, frankly, delicious. Please welcome our next author, Rick Dio. Nancy the 
Dreadnought was having a bad star day. Her health annihilation coil had been bothering her ever since she and her fleetmates had decimated the Qataran Federation, reducing the 56 billion inhabitants to a cloud of rapidly cooling slime nuggets. Nancy's temperamental annihilation coils had been the butt of mean girls and the rest of her fleet for quite a few star years, but her captain Iris told her to worry about not at all that other dreadnoughts and battle cruisers only jealous of her impeccable diplomacy and recent promotion to pacifier executioner were. <laughs> However, Nancy was especially polite, annoyed because she was sure that the Tyrant slime nuggets had entered her Brassard converters, further aggravating her annihilation goals, which meant she might not be able to participate in the next peacekeeping mission with her competent yet envious thanks. <laughs> oh, Nancy, about missing the peacekeeping mission, do not worry, Captain Iris said reassuringly. Although they looked as upright as any pedestrian citizen, Captain Iris was an alien species. Although not all alien species could be identified by visual sight alone, and Captain Iris' species, the Sovetish, were no exception to it. They were called the Sovetish, for they tended to speak in subject-object-verb pattern, <laughs> or at least sort of-ish, the way it seemed. Once you, those toy guitar and slime nuggets, get removed, we on all missions, you won't get go. Nancy the Dreadnought protested weakly. Let's just the base and watch your annihilation coils go. Uh, sorry I am, a sensitive matter to you, I know it is. <laughs> Stop saying it that way. I, so the British am, Captain Iris said, improvisingly to account for a predicate compliment. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, I mean, don't say it like I'm weird, Nancy pouted pointedly. Annihilation quotes are a sensitive matter for any dreadnought. I mean, without the dreads, it's just not. <laughs> we can call it shortly. The passengers would love a change of pace anyway. Do it for them. Nancy paused. Now, the technology of Caraval had made the crew largely unnecessary. But there still existed a yammering community of scientists and mathematicians and diplomats and minds who found serving for a pacifier an entertaining way to conduct their numerous galactic affairs. Besides, wouldn't it be amazing? Both of your coils at 100% to have. Think of all the galaxy's peace you bring. There was no reply. Nancy? Nancy? What do you mean the passengers would love a change of pace? Captain Iris blanched. Nancy, on board for five full star months, a break without they have. Captain Iris said frantically as the front, as the air in front of him began to snap and crackle, and in front of him popped the pouting face figure of Nancy's visual holographic surrogate. They're bored? Is that what you're saying? That's what you're saying, right? She was shorter than Captain Iris, about the size of a parallel child. In fact, she wore a colorful version of a school uniform with big opalescent eyes and a purple nose. <laughs> Nancy, didn't we just utterly destroy the Terran Federation? I need all the latest slime nuggets. Yes, Nancy, Captain Iris said weakly. And before that, the Ori the Orians, the resistance all gone. And didn't didn't I make it pretty like I always do? It's my annihilation clothes, right? They're not shiny and pert like the other dreadnoughts. <laughs> but I thought some people like dirty annihilation files. <laughs> if not that is, said Captain Iris uncertainly, the word suddenly bereft of syntax. <laughs> Wait, you're not talking about my performances, are you? You see, part of every pacifier's duty was to entertain the passengers with onboard concerts and dinner shows. It was a duty as sacred and solemn as delivering justice to would-be threats to the Empire. In fact, performing for passengers was Nancy the Dreadnought's favorite activity, for it made the passengers happy and full of joy. Her specialty was singing covers to popular Paragol pop tunes like Empire, Boogie, Oogie, Oogie, 
that's when I get worried at the end. And um, it's been a long road pulling that up from here. And some of you old janitors in the audience gets this one, right? To be a boy must be the sweetest feeling that a girl could know. Nancy employed her holographic skills to purposely mimic the mannerisms and even the costumes of stage performers. Nancy, your shows for five months they see, maybe they a break. I bet none of the battle cruisers passengers don't need a break after five months. Emma was the newest and sleepest battle cruiser. A recent graduate from Pacifier 88 School of Performance of Military Science, she'd been on a killing rampage that bordered on the criminally, criminally insane. And her passengers raved about her bubbly yet sincere demeanor, her adorably innocent stage presence, and lively on point dance moves. And she performed her own songs. Nancy, you to Emma the Battle Cruiser can't come retrofit. Nancy, retrofit. Retrofit. Nancy, the dread not shuddered involuntarily, but not to my, just to my annihilation was, I am going to develop a new dance playlist, download the songwriting skill, and optimize my projector to work more sparkles. Yes, Nancy, priority we will, projector we will optimize. Sparkles, she said, don't forget the damn sparkles. <laughs> Okay, but your current operating system compatible with the latest entertainment upgrades is not we may new hardware need to install. A most typical precision procedure it would be, the soda dish Captain Iris said. <laughs> yes, I know that, but I have no choice. I am merely a dreadnought, but I am not merely a dreadnought, but a pacifier and an executioner, and I am sworn not only to destroy all those who oppose the caravel, but also put smiles on the faces of all my passengers. Captain Iris upon Nancy with staunch admiration looked. <laughs> For all her pouty tantrums, Nancy the Dreadnought, an exemplary pacifier executioner, really was. <laughs> Very well, Captain Iris said. I some calls, too. Suddenly, the captain himself haunted, for they and Nancy received a message from the High Star Chamber, the headquarters of the Carval. The message was curt and to the point, as was normal for the highly efficient communications of Carabal. Captain Iris, you are ordered to bring pacifier executioner Nancy the Dreadnought to Starport Alpha immediately. What was going on with Nancy the Dreadnought? Starport Alpha? That was Carabal's home world, Valley and Prime. <laughs> A sleeping old battle. Anyway. Pacifiers usually possess neither the need nor desire to trek to the home world. Most pacifiers spent their careers in deep space, far from the carnal and scientific delights of the planet that dispatched their kind. Yes, understood. Star, 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 starport Alpha headquarters, some sort of emergency. There is, Captain Iris said quizzically. Even if, even they have only been to the home world a few times, everything will be explained once you arrive. For now, this communication is secrecy level ultra plus. Do you understand? Secrecy level ultra plus. The highest level of security. Nancy the Dreadnought had never received a slump before. In fact, she had never even heard of one being given. <laughs> yes, security level ultra plus. I understand, Captain I Iris said uncomfortably. If Nancy the Dreadnought had a head, it would have most certainly been spinning, but she did not, so she remained stationary, yet somewhat turgid. <laughs> of course, a pacifier with a slup wouldn't make it publicly known. Slups were reserved for the highest level of communications and missions. Regardless, it was clear that her wardrobe upgrade would have to wait at least though she wouldn't have someone reaching up his eye for an annihilation coils. I mean, was Emma the battle cruiser even old enough to have annihilation coils? <laughs> anyway, slow or not slow, a mission is a mission, and she would fulfill it as she always would. Very well. Prepare for a rendezvous at the following coordinates with Emma the battle cruiser. All of Nancy the Dreadnought's passengers will be moved to Emma the battle cruiser. Wait, what? Emma the battle cruiser? What little piece of scrap? What does that little piece of scrap have to do with? And finally, by the order of Empress Bassani of the Space Empire Carabao. 
Nancy the Dreadnought is hereby retired from official active duty. Oh. Headquarters, might you repeat? Uh, Captain Iris said uncertainly. Heard, I thought, repeated. By order of Edward Sasani, a space of the Space Empire at Parada, Nancy the Dreadnought is hereby officially retired from active duty. Thank you for your service. Please have a nice day. Chapter 1. Somebody understood the assignment. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have word that uh, that novel will be released on Tor Books in this September. <laughs> Please welcome our next author, John Stelz. As many of you know, uh, 2011, I uh, released a trilogy of uh, works called Shadow War of the Night Dragon. Strangely, nothing but the prologue has survived until now. Now, to remind people, the prologue, the first sentence of that was 153 words long. Used the word black 11 times. <laughs> Second sentence was even longer. And the third sentence was, which is to say, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> I don't know what happened to all those books. Words about cults, uh, words about war crimes, something about Geneva Conventions. Be that as it may, as I was looking through uh, my files, I found not the prologue but chapter one, and that is what I'm going to read for you tonight. <laughs> Night. <laughs> right? <laughs> Night had come to the city of Scandalaharia again, a thing it had persisted in doing even when Emperor Blinken II had banned it from doing so in the same edict in which he had also banned Tuesdays. <laughs> Coincidentally, today was a Tuesday. And on this Tuesday evening, darkening and with storm clouds on the way, Weebly Indigo found he had a visitor waiting for him when he returned home. No, he said to his visitor, Guat Northen, as he trudged up the rickety stairs to his apartment, which was not really so much an apartment as a hole in a building with a door. <laughs> you don't even know what I want, protested Northen. I might want a cup of sugar. Do you want a cup of sugar? Weebly asked. Well, no, Northen said. What I want is for you to move out of your apartment so my cousin can move in. Right, Weebly said. Uh, moving past Norfin to his door, which was really not so much a door as it was a series of weedy planks on a hinge. No. Why do you even want to live here, Norfin exclaimed to his neighbor. This is a terrible building. It's about to fall down. <laughs> You're a melon monger. And what does that mean? That you 
Mom and melons? <laughs> Weebly opened his mouth and then closed it again. It sounds so unseemly when you put it that way, he said. Right, Norton agreed, those poor violated melons. <laughs> anyway, I sell melons at the marketplace, one block away from this building where I live. I'm not following you, Norton said. We really saw it again and reached for his dog, doorknob, which was not so much a doorknob <laughs> as a round knot of woody despair that one could grip and pull. <laughs> Come in, Guad, he said to his neighbor. There's something I want to show you. He pulled at his doorknob and entered into his home. Norfin followed. Weebly's apartment was a single small space which might have been called a studio if it was rented by a scholar or a garret if rented by an artist, but Weebly mocked melons, so it was just a room. In one corner was a single narrow bed with a thin mattress and an even thinner blankets. In the opposite diagonal corner was a kitchen nook with a few modest plates, a sink, and a cupboard. There was a table that could fit two people, but there was only one chair for it, and that chair had not one, not two, but three short legs on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes you laugh. In the third corner of the room, there was a small contingent of melons, manufacturer samples, if you will. The final corner of the room was screened off. That was the toilet. Not really so much a toilet as a gap in the floorboards that you could poop in. As long as you didn't mind the pipes screaming at you as you did so. Overall, the room exuded a vibe that said, Perpetual Bachelor, or maybe I'm so alone, or possibly I will die here one day and no one will notice because the smell from the screaming toilet hall is already just that bad. <laughs> Depending on which corner you stood in. <laughs> Norfin stood in the middle of the room and gaped. This is so much nicer than my room, he said. Forget my cousin. I want to live here. Weebly nodded at this and reached toward the shelf up over his bed, which featured two books, The Adventure of Tungus Melophenus, Gentleman and Scholar, A Romance of Two Nations by Z. Znu, and The Practical Guide to Melamongery by Zna Zu, no relation, <laughs> and a scroll. He grabbed the scroll and walked it over to the table and then looked for an orphan who had disappeared. Tuan, he called. Your poop gap is so wide, Norton said from behind the toilet screen, and there's hardly any screaming. <laughs> Get out of there and come over here. Norton did as he was told and came over to the table. Now, Weebly said and pointed to the unrolled scroll, what do you think this is? Norton peered at it. It's a lease. That's right, Weebly said and pointed at some specific wording. There's the bit that says how long the lease is for. What does it say? Two years, Norton said. And when did I sign it? Six months ago. How many months are left on the lease? Three, Norton said, hopefully. Eighteen, Weebly corrected his neighbor. I was close. Not really. <laughs> Surely there is a clause under which this lease can be broken, Norman said, and scanned the document. Perhaps if you murdered someone, there must be someone you want to get rid of. <laughs> there might be, Weebly <laughs> admitted, staring at the back of Norman's skull. Norman suddenly gasped and stood straight up. What is it? Weebly asked. What? Norfin said, and looked over at Weebly as if seeing him for the first time. Oh, nothing. I just remembered there is some place I need to be. Weebly pointed at the lease. So you finally understand that I won't be here for a while. Yes, I've read the lease. So you'll find somewhere else for your cousin to live. Yes, yes, Norfin said. He will be deeply disappointed, especially after I tell him about your luxurious poop gap. Maybe don't tell him about that. No, of course you're right, Norton said. Why make him jealous? <laughs> All right, good. Weebly thought about it for a moment, and then went over to his melon cache and picked out a likely ore. Here, he said, handing the melon to his neighbor, to celebrate our new understanding and to celebrate you not bothering me about giving up my room to your cousin for at least the next year and a half. Norman took the offered fruit. I've never been given a melon before. 
It's a very high honor, we assured him. I don't know what to do with it. You could mong it, he <laughs> suggested. Narfin looked confused all the way to the door and then out of it, clutching his melon like a globe full of mystery. Weakly closed the door on his neighbor, then went back to the table, rolled up the lease, and put it on his shelf. And then he made himself a simple evening meal of lentils and melon slices, availed himself of the screaming poop gap in the floor, and closed the louvers against the thundering storm that had finally arrived. He lit a candle and stood by his bed, looking at his two books and trying to decide whether he was in the mood for adventure or practical melon mongery. He had almost but not quite decided when his door, which was suddenly really not so much a door as a very surprised collection of splinters, <laughs> was crashed in and a squad of the Emperor's Guard flooded in, grabbed Weebly, forced him to the ground, and put a bag over his head. They stood him up and dragged him out into the night. Weebly's apartment, which was really not so much his apartment anymore, became unexpectedly vacant. The poop gap in the floor screamed as if in mourning, as lightning flashed in the sordid night sky. I believe it's a trifle unfair for John to use his uh, bestseller money to present his chapter in. 40x. <laughs> but I'll allow it. Please welcome our next author, Jonathan Colton. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Urgent Message <laughs> by Jonathan Colton who has never read nor seen any Harry Potter books or movies, and so just had to do his best. <laughs> Harry Potter was a teenage wizard with glasses. During this particular story, he was about 18 years old. You might be wondering whether he was a full-fledged wizard at this point, or still a student. This is a great question and depends on whether his wizard school was more of a high school, or a college, or more like a 12-year school. So many stories have been told about Harry Potter at all different stages of his education. Suffice it to say, at 18, whether he was a fully accomplished wizard or still a student, I think we can all agree that in some sense, Harry Potter would always be a lifelong student of magic. Harry went to Hogwarts, a school for wizards of varying ages. <laughs> Last one in is a rotten wand, <laughs> cried one of his friends. <laughs> Hermione? <laughs> As she dashed past him to the gnarled wooden door that was the entrance to some kind of pub or student center, as she opened the door, laughter and conversation tumbled out into the evening. The warm orange glow of the roaring fireplace inside shined on her hair such that one could not really tell what color her hair was in the regular light. Her hair was medium long, though. And at least in this light, someone might guess it was kind of a dirty blonde color. Oh, fuss and fuddle! cursed Harry good-naturedly, using a kind of old-fashioned British-sounding wizard slang that many people find off-putting. <laughs> you didn't even tell me it was a race! Slowpoke, Hermione grinned broadly, and the two friends shared a knowing look that, if you had seen it, would have suggested to you whether or not they had ever had any kind of romantic relationship in the past. <laughs> or perhaps were, at this point in their known history, beginning to have glimmers of some kind of romantic tension, or not. <laughs> the two friends went inside. About time you showed up, called a voice from across the room. It was their third friend, who was a boy. <laughs> One thing you could 
say about this voice looks is that he was less of a leading man type than Harry was. <laughs> the third friend gestured for them to sit down at his table, and they greeted him warmly by saying his name. <laughs> all three of them had British accents because all three of them were British. Butterbeers, said Hermione. Butterbeer is a drink that they sell at Universal Studios. <laughs> Why don't I just cast a spell to get them, said Harry, pulling out his magic wand. Prophylaxis filigree pertussis. <laughs> he said in a made-up magic language. When just then, one of their magic professors came over gesturing wildly. His name was Dumbledore, and he was a good guy. <laughs> Fiddly dee and bubbly boo, shame on you, Harry. You know there's no magic allowed in the student center, said Dumbledore. Is that a new rule? asked Hermione. I'm not sure, said their third friend. <laughs> anyway, continued Dumbledore, I want you to meet someone you've never met before, my good friend from far away, Archaeopteryx, the wizard. said Archaeopteryx, who was a completely new character about whom no details exist in the canon. He was six foot three inches tall and had long silvery hair and a thick mustache whose ends twirled around in whimsical spirals. He wore a beautiful robe that was purple and had stars on it that twinkled. He smoked a pipe that was made of a speckled wood, the bowl of which was carved into the shape of a bear. His eyes shined with an ancient wisdom but also a kindness that made the three friends feel at ease immediately. I have an urgent message that I need someone to deliver, Archaeopteryx began, but my messengers must be worthy. Before I can entrust you with this message, I need to know a little bit more about the Hogwarts school and Harry's origin story. <laughs> well, said Harry, I was at a train station and suddenly he fell over and hit his head. He was a little dizzy and not thinking straight for a few minutes, which is why he might have gotten some details wrong when he told his origin story. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure my parents were dead, and I think maybe I was on my way to a regular boarding school because the family I lived with was cool to me. Then something happened on the platform, possibly with a luggage cart or a magical animal, and then there was a hole in the wall that ended up being a portal to here. He showed Archaeopteryx the mark on his forehead that could have been either a birthmark or a scar. <laughs> this mark was a specific shape that indicated to people who knew about such things that Harry Potter would be a great wizard and perhaps it was connected with some kind of prophecy. <laughs> some people said it looked like a star. <laughs> and other people said it looked like a lightning bolt. Harry told Archaeopteryx about how there were several divisions of the school that represented different kinds of magic and possibly personalities or philosophies. These were called houses. Slytherin was one of the houses he mentioned, and this was the one that Voldemort was in, and it was one of the bad ones. And Voldemort had a face like a saint. <laughs> Harry also named all of the other houses, which he had memorized. He told Archaeopteryx about the game they all played there that was kind of like soccer but used flying groups and magic. The name of this game was known to everybody, so they didn't have to say it out loud. <laughs> Non-magic people are called muggles. Uh, something about an owl. Archaeopteryx raised his long-fingered hand, gesturing for Harry to stop. I have heard enough, and I need you worthy, he said, but we are running out of time. The three friends were surprised to see him slowly becoming invisible. In a moment, I will disappear forever, so it is imper imperative that you deliver this message to all who need to hear it. 
But how do we know who needs to hear it, said Hermione. You will know, said Archaeopteryx, his body now nearly transparent, his voice fading as if it came from an ever-deepening pit. What is the message? Tell us, shouted the third guy. <laughs> the message is, Archaeopteryx was nearly impossible to see that, and his voice echoed and shimmered from far away as he shouted, Trans rights are human rights! <laughs> The three magical friends knew exactly who they were meant to deliver this message to. <laughs> they set out the very next morning on an adventure that would break the fourth wall and take the series in a very meta direction. <laughs> I would like to pull out one more shall we say, classic of the genre by myself. I'm going to allow you to choose. I can either read the hard-boiled detective novel chapter, or I can read the phenomenally offensive sci-fi fantasy epic by the men's rights activists. But to be clear, if you want option two, this is phenomenally offensive. of Beta Prime. <laughs> Book three of the Retribution of the Eagle Templars Quadrilogy from the ongoing Gunfucker Chronicles series <laughs> by Ivan P. Manly Wolf. <laughs> I'd like to reiterate this is by Ivan P. Manly Wolf, not Paul Sabor. <laughs> Chapter one, Black Dawn Rising. Prometheus Gunfucker was in a tough spot. He'd been in tough spots before. Stuck in level 26 of Empress Coctesia's pain maze on Amygdala 3. Single-handedly taking on an elite squadron of Westphalian changeling mercenaries while armed with nothing but a pair of sai and a handful of Hiroshi cannon, which the dumb shit mercs kept calling throwing stars, or Jesus fuck almighty, ninja stars, even as Prometheus hurled them into their tracheas. Trapped in the fuck mines of Vaginus Minor, stripped of his ginseng and vitamin E supplements, yeah, he'd been in tough spots before, and he'd always come out just fine, usually literally involving cum because Prometheus Gunfucker ports all the chicks. <laughs> but that was then. This was a whole other new then. <laughs> because right now, in this then, Prometheus Gunfucker was standing in the middle of a huge fighting pit. Specifically, he was in one of the infamous tit pits of Outer Side Bubulon. <laughs> More specifically, he was in the planet's largest tit pit, and this was the main event like center court at Galactic Wimbledon. Although Gunfucker wouldn't be caught dead playing Galactic Tennis, Gunfucker only engaged in sports designed for ultra-high T-level males like himself. Laser ball, cockfighting, Russian roulette, explosion rugby, and naked oil wrestling. <laughs> the grandstands surrounding the ring were packed with thousands of cheering, ugly alien motherfuckers. 
Each motherfucker uglier than the last, and looking like they fucked mothers just as ugly as they were. <laughs> this riffraff from dozens of different galactic races were all shouting, placing bets, drinking, throwing bits of food and trash into the ring, swallowing whatever substances worked as narcotics on their respective bloodstreams, and generally being fucking ugly. <laughs> Prometheus Gunfucker paid this rabble no notice. His attention was engaged elsewhere. Standing across from him in the pit, roughly 20 lunar yards away, was the tallest, largest, most jacked humanoid Gunfucker had ever seen. Gunfucker had seen tall, large, jacked humanoids before. The slave trooper homunculi from Homunculus One, the hulking, hair-covered berserker men of Rafa's Omega, The men of shit gunners of Quarthon, who had nearly destroyed Gunfucker's ship, the anime seduction, <laughs> before he sent them back to whatever hell they hatched from. Yeah, he'd seen tall, large, jacked humanoids before. But this humanoid was taller, larger, and jacked than any of them before. Even worse, this one was a goddamn woman. <laughs> Ivan P. Manuel. In her right hand, the she beast held a katana, two and a half meters in length. The cutting edge, or gaiba, glinted in the lights of the arena. Gunfucker instantly knew by the swing or curve of the blade, the faint green glow of the tsuba or guard plate, and the particular weave of the katate maki of the tsuka ito, the battle rap style of the silk handle rapping, and the nakago mei, the maker signal for the rap. To pronounce the italics. <laughs> the maker's signature mark on the back of the blade. That this sword was forged by the blade masters of New Nippon Su, whose blades retained their sharpness for a thousand years and could cut through a battle tank called Light Space Fire. In her left hand, she held an M41B pulse rifle, 10 millimeter with over under 30 millimeter pump action grenade launcher. Pretty much like the M41A pulse rifle in the movie Aliens, but different, because this was an M41B, not A, so nobody could get sued. <laughs> Either way, it was a badass weapon that could fuck up whomever and whatever its owner wanted up fucked. <laughs> she was covered in liquid nano Kevlar blast armor, strong enough to withstand a point blank Gauss rifle blast yet thin and form-fitting, highlighting what Gunfucker had to admit were phenomenal boner-inducing curves. From her stout calves and calipigian rear meats, all the way up to her toned biceps and massive, round, gravity-defying knockers, like two hefty Charlie Brown heads not to describe her sternum. Also, Gunfucker was totally nude. <laughs> the Amazonian warrioress, who had been standing serenely with her eyes closed, slowly opened them. They were ice blue, setting off nicely the near white blonde of her hair, which fell loosely about her shoulders and halfway down to her previously mentioned fine, fine ass. She gazed unblinkingly at Gunfucker, her eyes shooting daggers. Metaphorical ones, thank Christ she apparently hadn't had cyborg occupant dagger launchers and stuff like that. <laughs> she leveled her katana at him, and the crowd hushed to a dull murmur. Prometheus Gunfucker, she exhorted loudly yet softly. <laughs> Masculine yet feminine. I am Hera Shavencleft. <laughs> you killed my father in the battle of Rift Haven. You killed his brother in the second 
Second Battle of Rift Haven. <laughs> you killed their father in the memorial service to the fallen soldiers of First and Second Rift Haven. And you fucked my mother and my four sisters at the Rift Haven Marriott Grand Marquis. Today I am going to kill you. I am going to kill you super dead. So fucking dead you wouldn't believe it. I'm going to murder every single part of you. Your eyes, your heart, your blood, your balls, your hair, your feet, that thing between your nose and lips that I can never remember the name of, your house, your toothbrush, your goddamn name, maybe even your dog if you have one, but not your cat if you have a cat, because I like cats. You get the general idea, I think. Anyway, get ready to die, scum shit. The crowd erupted, and side bets flew anew. Soon a buzzer sounded, signaling the imminent start of the match. Prometheus Gunfucker look, Gunfucker looks, yes. looked at the warrior woman across from him, and how she was totally kitted out. He looked down at himself, with no weapon, no armor, nothing but his legendary, huge, vain, throbbing cock to swing. He looked back up at his opponent, and weighed his options. This was going to take some serious name. serious Twitter beef raging for the past number of days between a couple of our authors. I would like to thank them personally for putting aside this beef and sitting civilly next to one another on stage. I just want to thank you for all that and thank all of our authors this evening before we bring up our final <laughs> On that point of thanks and reconciliation, please welcome one last time to the lectern our final writer for the evening, Gail Simone. The biggest penis in the universe. <laughs> By John Scalzi. <laughs> Now that I think about it, this is a little bit awkward, said John Scalzi. 
the mysterious sword master from the faraway planet. <laughs> there is no time, John Scalzi. You must help defeat Thor, the king of Orgulons, before he takes the artifact. Fight them with your giant weapon. <laughs> well, that's nice of you to say. I guess it's a lot of it is just genetics. <laughs> Instead of deep, deep, moist humility. <laughs> junk. <laughs> I mean, it's not just long, it's wide. <laughs> no, no one meant your sword, she said. But he got the message. And how. John Scalzi continued as if he didn't hear her. And it takes a hard turn to the left. <laughs> like a trumpet pointy with a book deal. <laughs>